right, so Russ, let's start with uh, tell the good folks about you and what you do. How tell you the good folks about me. Uh -huh. I was an artist at the Modesto School, uh, MJC. Built an animation called Brandon Justice, all stop motion and Amiga based. And then showed it to some guys at a convention and they were all excited to see it. And they go, hey, come and take a look at what, we, what you did. So I went in, job interviewed, and got that. And then uh, did a few years of video gaming. Then parents got, her, uh, got sick, so someone had to stay, take care of the family business and everything. And then uh, just been playing around with YouTube. We had a YouTube site up and coming, and then all of a sudden I got hurt again. I got hurt this time, brown recluse bite. And now we're, re we're, we're like a rebuilding stage, like a football team. And, and then also everything else that's happening. You know, just stuff like that. And what about you? Who might you be? All right, so I'm Brian Linville. I own a Sacramento game development studio called Stigma Games. And I got my start uh, in the 90s. I did some design work for Dungeons & Dragons. And that was pretty cool. And then I went, OK, I'm going to go be a musician for the next 10 years. Did that, got really frustrated being a musician, trying to find drummers who can play. And after that, I decided to get back into game development. I worked for a couple companies online. And there is our third. Our third guy <laughs> showed up. Third guy. Player three. Player three Player has three a has new challenger. challenger. They said they were going to come and get me. Oh. Oh, yeah, wow. I shouldn't have believed that. No. So we now got a new challenger here. Are you going to film the whole thing from this position? Yeah. Great. From the artist position. <laughs> it's got yeah. a nice right, right, artist right. feel to it. Real you know, close. That, that, that Neo feel of like, they can, we can catch you picking your nose. <laughs> That's what we want to see. That's really what this is about, is game developers pick their nose. Mm. Dot com. Oh, yeah. I don't know if they, if they saw the updated title. Yeah. No, yeah. that hasn't, that hasn't come out. Yeah. So my, my company primarily, we make, you know, cool, awesome games. Uh, we do a lot of outsource work. We got hired by Wells Fargo to do a um, game for their museums. And so they hired us again, so we're, we're working on that. It's not as glamorous and exciting as I would like, making like, antique replicas of things. But it, it's cool. It's nice to work for a, a, a big company like that. So that's what I do. Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Kohler. I'm the games editor at Wired, and I've been writing professionally about video games since 1996, which means that I've just entered my third decade nice. of writing about video games in exchange for money. That don't sound right. No, definitely not. There's something wrong with me. All right, so Chris, can you tell us a little bit how you got your start? Um, yeah, there's a story. Um, I was doing, uh, what we had before YouTube was uh, photocopiers, and um, I did a, a black and white fanzine about video games, which I called Video Zone, and I named it after the uh, final stage in, in Nick Arcade, you know, the game show. The, the, uh, so I was like, I want to write about video games as my, as my job. So I, I would start um, making these fanzines because I had found out through video game uh, magazines that, you know, people made fan newsletters about games. This is like 1993. And so I was like, wow, that sounds like a great idea. So I started doing that. And um, I kept doing that. Like 1996, there was a magazine called Game On USA. And it was published by On America, which is the, the um, they're published by Viz, right? The, um, the, the Japanese manga publisher. Um, and they did the first ever video game magazine based purely on Japanese games called Game On USA. And, um, uh, the editor put his email address in the magazine, like printed it in the magazine, which nobody really did at that time, since 96. So I wrote to him, I'm like, hi, I was 16, I was like, oh, can I send you my fanzine, whatever? And he actually invited me to, to write for them. And like, that's how I kind of like weaseled my way into writing about games. So how did you get started? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> so, uh, I got my start around the same time. I, uh, one of the things that was cool about Dungeons & Dragons at the time is that you could submit designs to them for different levels, different games, different modifications on the rules. And they were looking for to build a, a system that you guys probably haven't heard of because it was terrible and it died, called the Skills and Powers System. Anyone, is that familiar to anyone? 
No, awesome. <laughs> right here. I had a book. Okay. I had a book. So I did some design work for that. I should have brought it and got it signed. You could have. <laughs> I feel so sad now. <laughs> My second edition book could have been signed. The only person that had a copy of it, and I could have signed it for you. <laughs> I feel so sad. But, so I'm uh, sad that I'm sitting be between you. I feel like you need to be closer. We should mind melt like Vulcans? No, no, I just meant hug. <laughs> no. We don't, we don't hug. We mind melt. Remember, so, this is... Uh, this right. is uh, so uh, after that, I, I, I mentioned I was you know, decided to give up game development for about 10 years and be a musician, and that was, that was cool and frustrating at the same time. And so I got back into game development, and I worked, because there's nothing to say it, there's not much happening in Sacramento for game development, and so I would work for different companies where I would telecommute, and that's really frustrating as a designer when you're designing all this cool, awesome stuff, and there's producers that are going, let's cut that, let's cut that, let's change this, and what's frustrating when you're not there to defend why it has to be this way, why you want this in here and whatnot. And I remember one company that I worked for, and I won't tell the, mention their names, because I don't want to talk smack about them, but I, I complained to them about how they had changed my design so much, and they said, you know, it's none of your business what we do. It's our game. It's our product. You're just hired to do what we tell you to. That's real motivational. It is. That's, yeah, a, that's was, a way to get like, somebody to turn yeah. in their best work. But that's why a lot of artists get yeah. flustered, too, because the artists have the same thing in the, in the artist stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You end up bucking heads with them. They tell you one thing, and then when they see it, they go, no, 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 we didn't really want that. We want something completely different. Yeah. I've, I've worked in for companies where artists were called stupid because they did what they were told, not what was in the mind of the producer that they couldn't articulate well. Well, the problem is like, the producer could never articulate what he wanted. Yeah. As where the artist could articulate what he wanted on paper, what he could visualize, but the producer couldn't uh, articulate what he wanted or even give a rough draft what he wanted. So he'd, he'd uh, whip the artist until he said, I want it this way, I want it this way, I want it this way. And he's still not happy with it because he doesn't know what he wants. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Seems like and so it gets very volatile, volatile at that point. Right. So uh, next thing, let's talk about what do you think is a common misconception about people who don't work in the industry mm. about what you do? About what I do. Yes. I, I think, I, I guess the big misconception is you play video games all day, um, which uh, that would be a nice job to have. Um, right. I, I, I read a lot and I write a lot and I edit other people's things a lot. And really, I think one of the, one of the struggles with, with my job is that you have to like force yourself to turn it off because I think there's a lot of expectation that you're just playing video games all the time anyway so you'll just work that into your day and like there have been days where it's like I'm playing Final Fantasy 15 now and it's like um, I work a whole day writing, editing, etc. Maybe there's some game playing in there and then um, you know my wife comes home and kid comes home from daycare and I'm like oh I'm still playing video games and it's like Oh, like I think I'm having fun, but actually I'm that dad who never stops working, you know. And, and yeah. but there's that there is that assumption that you well oh well you sh you're supposed to be playing the games in, in your off hours rather than rather than doing it you know during the day. So I try to do my best to like shut myself off, but you can't because you're constantly trying to remind yourself that no playing video games is is fun. My job is fun, but it's like nah you need to have a life too. So Russ, what would you say is a common misconception that people outside the industry don't really know what it's like to be an artist in your industry? Well, one of them is everyone thinks it's all easy, that there's no milestones to meet, there's no responsibility, that it's they could turn in anything they want, anytime they want. Mm -hmm. they, they could turn in something like a, what I would consider five minutes before class and consider it excellent. And it doesn't work that way. Five minutes before class works in school, because the teacher's as bummed out as you are, and he doesn't want you there, but you're there to produce a product. And most, a lot of people come in expect to pro don't expect to produce a product. They want to produce a paycheck, and so they start bucking heads. I, I think that that happens. There's there's definitely a, a period in the a, a 
professional writer's life where you get that wake-up call as well, where it's like, if you're a professional writer, that probably means that you went through high school and you got an A on every English assignment you ever had, and the teacher was like, you're wonderful, you're so smart, and then you probably went to college, and maybe you got a little bit more pushback, but in the end, you know, you did really good, and then you, you maybe you even submitted a few pieces to a publication that's a little bit more lenient editorially, and they're like, oh, this is great, but then every now and again, you have that moment where an editor comes back to you and says, this needs major structural, you know, rewrites, or comes back to you and says, okay, you actually don't have the word count you thought you did. Can you say all, everything you just said in 1,000 words? Can you say it in 500? And that's, that's the craft. I mean, that right there is the professional like level. Like, Are you able to do that? Are you able to, A, put aside your ego um, and, and not be precious about your own work, but then are you also able to have the skill of being able to take something big and, and cut it down into something more manageable without losing the meaning? That's what you're getting paid for. And also, too, when you have control of editing, it's a lot more truer to what you were saying than someone else taking it and hacking it. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing, too. That's, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I definitely went through a period where I turned in something. You know, I started writing for Wired. Um, and, you know, that was, that was the big, big wake-up call for me where it was like they'd, they'd come back and they'd have totally changed everything that I wrote. And for me – and some people can't handle that. And some people – get out and they're like I don't want to do this because I don't like my stuff being chopped up and for me it was like it's disappointing to see the stuff getting chopped up but you know what I'm going to learn what it is you want so that the next time when I hand in you know my original draft it's going to be more along the lines of what you were looking for in the first place but then as you say it's it's my own words and I'm sure that's the same and way the part, a big argument. problem is learning to uh, the ability to know what they want most people only want to do what they want not what the people who are paying you want. Mm, right. One of the things that I would say that people outside the industry, uh, because I listen to what gamers say, I, I read comments of games, even games I didn't work on, just because I, I find it interesting. And one of the things that I think would surprise a lot of gamers is if you're thinking of a game that you really like and there's an animation that's not that great, there's some artwork that's not that great, game mechanics are not that smooth, and you're like, these developers are lazy, they're stupid, chances are they're very frustrated by those same things too. And I've met a lot of game developers who were like, hey, I will work off the clock, can I please fix this? And they're like, it's not in the budget, we have to ship it, I know you don't like it. And then they gotta listen to gamers go, you guys are stupid because you didn't fix this. I'm like, we couldn't. And so I think that would definitely surprise uh, gamers mm -hmm. out there. I want, you know, you, you sort of waved this away when you mentioned it, but the Wells Fargo thing is really interesting to me, that a company like Wells Fargo is coming to you and saying, we want you to make us a video game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, as I mentioned, there's really, there's some game companies here in Sacramento. There's uh, Fifth Planet Games. They make, they used to make Facebook games, and then that, the social media bubble burst, and then they moved to, uh, Click Nation also made social media games, and, and that, when that bubble burst, they've switched to, to the mobile space. And making mobile games is very, very difficult. Everybody thinks that, oh, you can just make Flappy Bird and you'll get rich. No. <laughs> no. There's like 600 games that get I added to the iStore every day. And I knew a developer that spent, he and his brother spent two years on a game. They released it. They're like, nice, we finally get to release it. They made a total of $200. The average person is going to make $1,000 on a game that they release. And I've met game developers that know that, and they pump crap out every week looking for that $1,000 on average so they can barely scrape by. That's another thing I think that would shock a lot of people is how little money game developers make. I think that would really surprise you. Did you have a question? Yeah, but you mentioned about how the, um, about how, like, the, you know, the, the average of $1,000, mm -hmm. like, um, like, how much? How, Yeah, I mean, that can, that can vary. The problem with mobile games in general is discoverability. You can make the most fantastic game ever, but if it doesn't take off in that first hour that it's in new releases before it gets pushed out, it's never going to go viral. It's never going to take off. And so you could spend years on a game like my friend Paul did. He and his brother did. And so you could put a lot of time into something 
or he can make a little crappy, flappy bird. And, but and the, th the thing with games, too, is nowadays you've got to compete with old games from the old platforms now being put on apps. And that hurts a lot, too, because they're taking existing uh, work and throwing it out there because they already know it has a fan base. Are we going to buy Flappy Birds 20, 2025? Or are we going to buy uh, Link? We're going to naturally gravitate to Link because we know Link has a... And that's a great point. One of the things that uh, Gaming Workshop did, the company that makes Warhammer, what they did is they said, I don't know if this is still this deal, but I remember hearing about this deal. They said, we'll split the profits 50-50 with anyone who wants to make a Warhammer. Now you might go, okay, so this company is going to take half your profits and they don't do any work, but that's actually a good deal for game developers because people search for Warhammer games. And so they might get half of this or 100% of this, and so it might be a good, good deal. Now I kind of went on a... Well, also too, going back to that for a minute, uh -huh. it's a good example actually because... You think about it, most people go, oh, I'm losing 50% of profit. I'm putting that much work in. But if you had to license the uh, name Warhammer, Fantasy or 40K, then you've got to pay for each license of Space Marines, for Orcs, for uh, whatever little, uh, little nuances they have. You've got to pay for each one of those licenses just to incorporate them in there. You may license Warhammer 40K and just license Space Marines, and you'll only get Chaos and... Uh, Space Marines, but you won't get the Space Wolves or the Blood Angels. You're going to have to now get a secondary license, but at 50%, they've given you to open the entire door to everything. You know, you get the entire library. The only thing that upsets people is when they start monkeying around with history, yeah. just to shoehorn their game into the history, because they're art of purist. Right. But, Chris, uh, I know I went on a weird tangent on there, but to answer your question, um, there are... And, and I don't, I don't want to. There's a lot of independent game developers in Sacramento, but there aren't companies with actual offices and studios in Sacramento that do 3D games. And so the reason why we got the Wells Fargo thing is because we were pretty close to it. <laughs> so I don't want to. I mean, I'd love to go because we do such fine quality work that they want to. No, we're we're it. And the guy, he was brutally honest with me. He said uh, the quotes that we get from big studios in the Bay Area are really, really high, and the reason why we look in Sacramento is because we thought you'd do it for way cheaper, and yeah, when I quoted him the price, uh, I said, this is what, okay, I, I see what you want, I've done the design document, I've calculated the figures, I know how much this will cost to do, and this much, and when I quoted him the price, he went, that's it? So, so yeah, he, he flat out told us that we, we low-balled, and he's like, yeah, well, you're hired. <laughs> Hell yeah. And I was really happy that they were very, very uh, thrilled. If you guys go to, you know where Old Tech is, you guys are all from Sacramento. If you go to Old Tech and you go to their museum, which used to be the Pony Express, which is now where they're located, and you see an antique gold scale, and you can adjust the weight for to weigh different gold nuggets. That was, that was something that I built me and a uh, programmer. Uh, I did much of the artwork on that. We had another artist that did a, a lot of work on that too, but that was that was Stigma Games that did that. Cool. Um, let's see. What, uh, so Chris, hmm. if someone wanted to be a journalist today in the game industry, hmm. now you, things were very different when you and I started, when you started. Indeed. What would you suggest someone who wanted to be a game journalist now, what would you suggest they do? Um, my, you know, I, I think that this is still absolutely true. Um, the particulars of it have changed a little bit, but I, I'd always told people, find a thing and be the expert on that thing, uh, and then be able to go to editors and say, hey, I'm an expert on this thing that you know, you're not an expert on, your staff members aren't an expert on, let me write about it for you. Um, for me, it was actually studying Japanese, uh, back when Japanese games were a lot bigger than they are now, um, and learning the language, and being able to go and say, okay, you know, editor, you have all your freelancers, but none of them actually read Japanese, so I'm going to, you know, review this, this Japanese game for you, uh, and I'm going to actually understand what's going on. 
Um, and so that was actually a, a good pitch for me. Today, I'm not sure what that would be because all kids all take Japanese in high school now anyway. Um, but, but like just, you know, a, another example is somebody that I hired at, at Wired was when in like 2009, 2010, I felt we were really lagging behind on mobile games as far as like our knowledge of what was going on in the mobile space. And somebody applied for the job and he had written a self-published book on iOS games. And I was like, you're hired. You stand out above everybody else because you figured out the thing that we need and you are coming in as an expert and you're just gonna bring something that, that I don't have. So try to identify uh, something that you can write about that other people cannot and then start doing it, you know, and kind of get that writing out as uh, wherever you possibly can. Um, it is tougher now, but I imagine it's just tougher across the board um, in video games to get noticed because I think in the I think in the 90s not as many people were um, submitting resumes or submitting samples or trying to get game design work or you know you could like in the 90s you could like show up at the front door of a video game developer and be like I live here do you need an intern but mm, it's not happening today yeah and it's so much easier to you know WordPress you know get to, to build a, a, a new site you can do that did you No, I think there's I think there's absolutely a place um, for talking about uh, classic games. I think people want that content. People want to read about that kind of stuff. I mean, if you look at the you know you look at the explosion of YouTube videos um, that are you know purely based on classic games, there's there's like a rich content mine there. Um, and it's good. I mean, it's good for me to be coming from the perspective of like having grown up with NES and Super Nintendo and things like that. That like I still have that perspective and can very easily. Um, you know, when the anniversary of a game is coming up, I can, you know, write a piece about why this game is important um, without having to, you know, go research it because I never played it before. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, I absolutely would say that interest in um, stories about <coughs> games that are not necessarily new. And the other thing is to really think about, I mean, even games that are six months old to a year old, I think Kotaku is doing a lot of really good work on they don't stop covering a game just because that game came out. Like one of the, the big issues with, with you know, video game coverage is you cover the news that it was announced, you cover the hands-on preview, you write the review, and then you never, ever, ever write about that game again, ever. Um, but Kotaku said, no, we're not gonna do that, and we're gonna continue to cover the communities that are in and around these popular games um, after release. Uh, and that has been a big winning uh, su you know, success for them. And I think that that is something that even freelance writers that are pitching publications should look at and say, well, what game came out a year ago that maybe this publication is already over, um, but I see an interesting story that they're, that they're missing. So Russ, if you had to start all over again and break into the industry as an artist today, what would you do today? Learn 3D graphics. 3D? Back when I did it, it was 2D. Now it's 3D, and it's a whole different animal altogether. And usually you got to get used to, as an artist, the lifespan of an artist tends to be five years. Mm -hmm. And then you got to upgrade your skills. You know, yeah. because you may see, cause what you do in five years is what you do, what you're going to be doing, what's 10 years worth of work sometimes. And then you find out you're obsolete because you don't fit in with the industry. And there's younger guys with the skills that you need to uh, do what they need. It's not like a programmer who has util utility skills or a uh, game designer who works with paper and pencil and uh, words, the artist is like, okay, you learn programs. Programs change. And that's the big thing, is that keeping up with the, you can never keep up with the technology as easy as you think you can. You know, it's easy when you're living out of a garage and taking classes at school, you can explore all you want, but when you're doing nine to five in one uh, program, it's a lot harder. Yeah, and I think one of the things that uh, is true about artists that I've seen is that 
depends pretty dramatically on the size of the company that you work for. So if you work for a small company and you want to do 3D games, if I'm hiring somebody and they're very good at drawing, they're very good at concepting out stuff, uh, but they don't have 3D modeling skills, like Russ has mentioned, and I find somebody who can do both, who am I going to hire? Now, their art is such a, a wide field that you're generally not going to find somebody who is a great concept artist, who's a great modeler, who's a great texture artist, who's good at rigging, who's good at animation, uh, and who can do all of these skills. Now, if you're a very small company, maybe you do want somebody that can kind of be mediocre in all of those. Uh, that's if you're a very small company. Um, a lot of times, if you're a small company, it's easier to just go, oh, hey, I know a guy that can rig, so we'll bring this guy on just for a little bit and then come in, or I know somebody who's a great texture artist and they'll come in. So generally speaking, if, if, you, if you need a specialist, uh, it's better to just have somebody come in temporarily than trying to have somebody. But uh, I would absolutely agree that having somebody that's a modeler and a concept artist, though at least those two skills together is going to vastly increase the amount of work that you can get. Now, if you're working for a very large company, uh, I've seen artists that all they do is they're a concept artist and all they do is the background in the concept. Or somebody that all they do is they just draw the lines of a character and then all someone does, they just color in stuff. So sometimes people get very specialized. Uh, in 3D companies, maybe somebody, all they do is paint spec maps, or all they do is just this really, really narrow focused stuff, and that may or may not be exciting to do, but they want somebody who is the best at that if it's a large company. So, um, yeah. Um, talking about the conception of a game, mm -hmm. um, I've heard, I've read different things from different uh, developers and publishers, and they talk about their process of uh, conceiving a game, and that some like to start with a story, some like to start with a, a game mechanic, and some people like to start with a piece of art. And if you've seen those different types of methods and how they vary from each other and such. I think, generally speaking, if you're going to develop intelligently, what you want to do is you want to figure out all of those things before you start production, uh, which I could launch into another topic, which, uh, which is related to this. Uh, one of the things that I've, one of the things that plagues the game industry is that, imagine this, programmers have no place in pre-production. They have nothing to do. They're not coming up with storylines, they're not coming up with game mechanics, they're not coming up with artwork, they have nothing to do. Programmers are very expensive to keep on staff. So imagine this, you just finished a game, okay? Do you lay off, because now you want to do the next thing, you lay off all of your programmers and then hope you can get them back, which isn't very easy to do sometimes. And while you do pre-production, or do you make your pre-production really, really short so you're not wasting money on programmers, keeping them on staff. And this is something that game studios struggle with. And so a lot of times we'll rush through pre-production and they'll, they'll hash out a storyline really, really quick because they don't really have time to work on it. They'll, they'll do some artwork that's kind of a clone of other games. It's not very original because they don't have time to develop new ideas. They got to get to production really quick. And so that's, that's definitely a problem. Now, I read an article that I thought was fascinating to me that talked about Pixar. Now, what Pixar does, and this is one of those things that maybe game studios should be looking at the way that Pixar does their development. They have two production teams. I know this is kind of straying off the topic of what you said, but it's fascinating to me, so that's what I'm talking about. If you guys, you guys are like, can you talk about something else? That's right. But so they have two production teams. And that's all they do, is they just make stuff, right? They don't, they don't plan anything out, they're just given artwork to just go with. And, and it's so they don't change anything, they just produce films and whatnot. 
so they have two different production teams that are, they spend two years on a game and they're out of sync with each other by a year. So one team starts while the other still got a year to go, so they're staggered like this. And then they have a pre-production team and the only thing the pre-production team does is they come up with the ideas, they write out the storylines, they work out the artwork, etc., and they produce a new product every year. So every year, they finish the pre-production and they move it off to one of the production team A, and then they go back to the drawing board, they spend a year pre-product and pre-production for a different movie, and then they hand that off to production team B. So they don't have to deal with that problem. And they have a rule that the production team or the pre-production team can't leave to go help the production team if they fall behind. That happens in game development a lot for because studios stagger like that too. And when you have the pre-production team and you have producers go, can we take from the pre-production team because we need to get this game out now. And that's very tempting for a game company to do. Is a steal from the pre-production team and then that pre-production for the move of the game that they're doing <coughs> is not so great because they're understaffed. And that's why I see in a lot of games storylines are not so great because they didn't have proper time to develop them. The artwork is not terribly original. And so that's something that I think plagues plagues the development. Would you agree? I, I see a lot of clones in the, the, the yeah. as because uh, I remember in the day in the '90s when you played games, you could choose, you could buy shovelware of different stuff, movies, whatever. Whoever thought Home Alone, uh, Home Alone, or uh, Tim the Tool Man would have had video games, <laughs> you know? And then gradually, as we went from one system to the next, slowly they started weeding it out, till finally we got to three and four, where we got Halo clone, Halo clone, Halo clone, Halo clone, Halo clone. That I just never bought a, a PlayStation 3 or 4 because I don't like the control of Halo to begin with. And I just don't like playing its clones. Uh, uh, do I want to buy a system that keeps, I'm buying the same game over and over, just repackaged differently? But imagine how easy that is for game companies to make clones of games. So they cut out that pre production time almost entirely. And they can keep, so they don't have to lay off programmers to keep just making the next one. Yeah. Um, I don't have a comment on Destiny. Either way, does anyone else want to wait? What on is that? Destiny? Destiny, it's like Halo. It's a shooter game. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. It probably was. It was not left in the oven long enough and didn't yeah. bake correctly. If you have, if you have the problems and listen to what we were said, it pretty much answers your questions right there. You know. Yeah. All right, so. Russ, what would you say is a common... Oh, wait a minute. This gentleman had a question in oh, the black sorry, jacket yeah, first. Do you think a locale can like, affect the video game development? Um, uh, say, for example, like Mojang, uh, Notch, Minecraft, because um, they're like based out in Sweden. Uh, One of, oh, sorry. I'm no, <laughs> going to restate the question. One of the things that uh, you notice is that I mentioned that game development is pretty, pretty scarce here in Sacramento. Now think about it this way. Uh, if the bulk of the, the cost of producing games is labor, right? Would you all agree? Now you think about it, where are all the game studios? In the Bay Area, LA, Austin, Seattle, places with high, talk, uh, high cost of living. So they're located at the place where labor costs the most. Does that sound stupid to anyone else, or do you think there's a reason for that? Anyone have an opinion? I uh, disagree. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, well, I mean, I mean, the reason, I mean, the, one of the reasons why I feel like the why those places are in the high cost of living is that is that um is that um the particularly in the Bay Area in particular, essentially the the digital age essentially was born in Silicon Valley, right? And so the and so the um so like the um, all the technology and the and the basis for which these industries are, are working with now, they essentially were birthed in these places. Large still largely are based and come out of those particular high areas. And part of the reason, and particularly in the actual innovations of the very first ones, actually increased the standard of living in those areas because it made their economy, it boosted local economies in those areas. Right. And 
so because the technology is there, that also means the people that know how to work on that technology are there. And that's a big deal, is if you have a game studio and you have to meet a certain release window, and you need, you need a whatever, you need a tools programmer, you need a, a, um, a rigger, you know, whatever, you need a certain person and you need them fast, if you're in a high de population density city, you're gonna be able to recruit that person fast. I can tell you, working in uh, here in Sacramento, if I need a particular person, oh my God, it can take so long for me to find the right person here. This is a very difficult place to make video games because there aren't those, there isn't the population here. I can eventually find them, um, but yeah, location makes a big difference. Now, I see a lot of studios, and in fact, I've kind of had to do this with Sigma Games, is that we've had to move more as a virtual studio. So I have a programmer that I work with that's really amazing, he lives in Michigan. Uh, and so it's, it's tough for me to, to, to deal with telecommuting like that. I like to have everybody sit you know, on a table together and uh, us all hash out ideas like that and be able to talk to people in person. But you know, there's, there's video chatting and, and, and I'm trying to get more and more used to that. But yeah, location is a big deal. So it seems like the flip side of what you're saying though is that if you're trying to break into you know, doing a certain job in video game creation, be ready and willing to move possibly to, mm -hmm. a, to an area yeah. like Sacramento where you might be more in demand. I would even and say, suck it up and live here instead of living in the Bay Area. Yeah, I think one of the things that, because I've given talks on how to break in the game industry a lot, and one of the things I think horrifies people is the number one thing I recommend on how to break into the game industry is leave Sacramento. Is go to the Bay Area, if you can afford it, go to LA if you can afford it. I think the cost of living in Austin is a little lower if you can stand the heat in the summers. Uh, Seattle's not too bad either. But um, trying to break into the game industry when you live in Sacramento is, is incredibly difficult because, well, you're not, probably not going to apply for a company here, although there is some jobs. Um, to give you an example, I talked to a recruiter at Fifth Planet Games. Just curious, has anyone here heard of Fifth Planet Games in Rockland? You have? Okay. Uh, they were on the, they've been on the news sparsely. But um, they were hiring for an artist, and they got about 200, uh, somewhere around their applications in the first week. So you think about that. You think about even a small studio that one person has kind of heard of uh, from the town that they're actually in, and imagine companies like uh, Blizzard, who they get tens of thousands of people applying for a single position. Now, uh, I think another thing that's frustrating, uh, well, I could tell you this story. I, I, think I'm, I think I'm off topic, but I don't even remember what the original topic was, so I might be way off. But to give you an example, I saw a content designer position for NCSoft that uh, I applied for uh, and you know, didn't hear anything back for that position. I was like, eh, kind of bummed because I was qualified for it, uh, you know, whatever. But I'm sure thousands of people applied for that job. Now, a couple weeks later, one of the recruiters at NCSoft uh, called me because he was familiar with some work I did on a different project. And he called me and said, hey, uh, is this so-and-so? I went, yeah, that's me. And he said, um, we have a content designer position. Do you think you might be interested in that? And I was like, you mean the one I applied for? <laughs> so he, they were not even aware that I applied for that position, and which I think should tell you uh, to, make, to, to make it even more daunting about breaking into the industry is when you apply for companies, chances are they don't even look at the resumes they get. Uh, one of the things that's even more terrifying is a lot of times when you apply, I'm sorry if I'm kind of hogging, <laughs> no. like I just realized that I, I'm kind of dominating right now, but I'll ask you guys questions in a second. 
um, is that a lot of times if you see a company is hiring for a certain job, you know, see job listings, chances are some of those jobs might have been filled before they were even posted on their website. Now, does anyone have an idea of why that might be? Inside networking. Mm -hmm. But why, but if they've already filled the position, why do you think they would post it on their website? No, I want to answer, but go ahead. I'm, I'm not part of it. No, I mean, <laughs> go ahead. Someone better for the job, maybe. Um, I almost want to say like, maybe. I almost want to say like, like part of like a something is almost like some stuff, almost like like an IRS like um an IRS like. Report. You're on the right track. Yeah, yeah. Did you want to add something? Recruiting and marketing are often closely tied, but um, that's what it is. I mean, sometimes companies are getting grant money from the government or you know whatever uh, tax breaks or whatever. Um, they have to at least give the illusion that they're allowing people outside the company to apply for stuff, which is why sometimes they'll either write the description to be oddly specific. Oh, yeah. When those, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> when it's like no person on earth could fulfill this yeah. except for like one guy. Yeah. yeah. Your name must have two, three R's in it. And yeah. Yeah, it must, it must speak Russian. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. We didn't find any other candidates. Yeah, only Vlad here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so that happens. Um, yeah, and that's, that's super frustrating. Um, do you guys have any now, what do you think? How do you how do you get around that? How do you make connections? How do you network to get around that? There, you know, I've I've done these sorts of panels before where it's like, um, you know, how do I get into video game journalism? How do I get, how do I get into the industry? And um, in my youth, I had done these these ill-advised sort of things because people end up coming back and saying, I did all the things you said on the panel, and it still didn't work. It's like, yeah, I don't think we actually said this will definitely work. It's like, what can you do to increase your chances from like 1% to 1.5%? I mean, the, the best thing I can say is that like, the, it, so much of it is, is figuring out how do I get known by people as being somebody who is reliable and somebody who should be hired to do these things because there are people out there who are just are very talented people that I don't want to work with because I've worked with them in the past, and the first chance they get, they they blow a deadline, you know, or they or they 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 they, they go in, you know, off the off the grid and you can't find them, or they they refuse to, you know, turn around um, a uh, a request for a rewrite, you know, and um, just so much of it is that level of professionalism that I will work with a person who is a who is worse at putting words together because they're professional and they're and they're diligent, um, and so it really is about. I mean, there are people that I know in the industry that like one time at one point they just started showing up. You know, <laughs> like you just started seeing them at things, and then the next, you know, maybe a year later, you know, they got hired for something and they got hired for something else, and it's, it's kind of striking that balance. And now, on the other hand, there's a lot of people who show up and then everybody's like, oh, that's that stalker. Stay away from that person. <laughs> so it's it's really a question of, of navigating the social waters yeah. so that you're part of the 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 group, um, but that you it seems like you belong there versus your versus your your glomming on. That's right. Kind of um, one of the things that I tell people, it's kind of some insider secret stuff right here, is and, and this surprises some people too. Is you guys are all familiar with LinkedIn, right? Yeah. Okay. So what I think surprises some people when I say this is that obviously there are recruiters from game companies that are on LinkedIn. Believe it or not, chances are if you send a LinkedIn friend request or whatever the heck it is to connect with them, they'll accept. Now you might go, well, why would they? Why would they be have a form of connection with me? I'm just you know nobody. Because it's their job. Because it's their job to get a list of candidates who are interested for working for their company. And so, another thing, recruiters, 
Yeah, have you guys ever heard of GDC, the Game Developer Convention in San Francisco? Yeah. Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. A lot of these recruiters, they go to GDC, and you can actually meet them in person. Um,